My research basis, as Peter said, it's qualitative. I spoke to 14 people like Brett, Philip Shaw, um, owners of businesses or, or marketing managers, that sort of thing. Um, we est I actually estimate that the number of tonnes accounted for by the people I spoke to is more than 100% of the purchased fruit in South Australia, so that probably just reflects the, the sort of rough estimates that they gave me, but it certainly shows you that we had a really good coverage of the people who buy the South Australian fruit. Um, and my, the first time I did this was 2013. Um, this is the third time, so I said to them what's changed in the past 12 months. And I think everything you've heard from, from Mark and Kim is what they said. Um, in a nutshell, I like this quote, more people are ringing. It's still tough. It's not great now or anything like that, but at least there's more people now ringing us. Um, some of them said there's not actually more money, but at least the customers are happier. Um, I'll show you, because th this is what I put up last year, only that said last year, now it says two years ago. So, so two years ago they said things are looking a bit better, but they could deteriorate. And then last year they said things are looking a bit worse, and they could deteriorate even further. So there was a sense always of trajectory. Things were either getting better or they were getting worse. Um, the sense I got from this year was, as Philip Shaw puts it, this is the new normal. So whether you're a grower or a winery, now is the time to think, don't hang on anymore, waiting for things to improve. This is how it is. If you can make it work now, that's the, then you're in the right business. If you can't, there's not much point in, in hanging around doing what you're still doing. The days of $1,200 for Chardonnay are gone for good. Uh, now, there were improvements. Um, you've heard these from the others, particularly the exchange rate, the FTAs, but it's slow. Another one that was mentioned a few times was that the 2015 vintage looked very good. And, uh, you know, this is a Weight Watchers definition of a good size. A good size is not too big and not too small. Um, but, you know, dis despite these positives, um, sales demand is still stagnant. There are still market distortions, the wet rebate in particular. Supermarkets just don't get any friendlier. And there are regulatory barriers to the Asian market. So I had some wineries who didn't feel that the FTAs or the Chinese situation was the be all and end all because um, there are still a lot of barriers to them in, in getting into those markets. Um, Two years ago, one of my interviewees, who was embarrassed to remember this, did say, if we get back to 75 cents, we'll be planting again. Well, of course, we're not. We're back at 75 cents, and we're not anything like planting again. Um, what they said now was that the, the difference is it is good, but what it does is it just gets you back at the table. It means we can now compete again with Chile and Argentina, but it doesn't mean that suddenly we're all reaping in the big bucks. Apart from anything else, the buyer wants his share or her share. So they know the prices that our exchange rate is eased and they want at least half of the um, improvement from that, which interestingly, again, the winery said it doesn't work both ways. <laughs> When our dollar goes up against the Australian, the American dollar, they, they don't want to give any of their margin. So what are the wineries doing? Um, you've heard this very clearly, I, I think a very strong message from Brett, which was also consistent, was the big investment in marketing. You don't cut your marketing budget when times are tough. Um, and also, the thing that's different about the market now, and again, this flows onto growers, is you, you can't anymore make a product, put it in a bottle, and then work out where to sell it. You have to know where you're going to sell it and then make the product to suit that market. And I think, you know, Brett illustrated that really well. So basically, one size doesn't fit all at all anymore for, with wine consumers. Um, and one of the flow-offs from that is if you get the wrong sort of fruit or too much or too little or a customer changes their mind, you can't just put that in a different bottle and sell it to someone else because it just doesn't work. The products are tailored to the customers. 
Um, and uh, in, in terms of the marketing investment, as one winery put it, it's easy to make the stuff. Selling it's the hard part. So even people who were having to make quite drastic cuts in staffing in their wineries were trying to hang on to their sales staff or they were putting on more sales staff. And you, you, you ask Philip how much time he spends basically dealing with his Chinese customers as opposed to um, running the winery. Um, so the other, the other message I got from, from the wineries was winemaking, it's winemaking by numbers now. So you, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. You need to maintain volumes to keep your cost of production down, but if your demand is down, you'd like to reduce supply, but then of course your cost, unit cost goes up and you're back to demand reducing even further. So you're trying to maintain volumes, but you've got volumes of wine that you haven't got a market for. So that's a real problem. Um, and then the other problem, which is really where the winemaking by numbers thing came from, my impression, was you've, you've got this price, you've got this shelf price, and then you've got to work backwards to, to make it work for you. So you've got an $8 product in Dan Murphy's, and you work out there's this much for winemaking, that leaves this much for grapes, okay? but it's got to be a McLaren Vale product, okay? So how much can I afford to pay for the fruit? Well, McLaren Vale Shiraz is a bit much for that, so can I use my 15% to put in a bit of Langhorn Creek fruit or Rattenbully fruit to make the numbers balance so that I can end up in budget with this fruit? So as they called it, playing the 15% game. And yet, at the same time, and all credit to the winemakers, you know, without exception, all of them want to pay sustainable prices and the reality is if you don't have grape growers, you don't have wine, do you? So they do want to pay sustainable prices, but the market doesn't always allow that. As I said, this is what they said. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the, the retailer margin is the non-negotiable element. I started one conversation with someone, I said, how's it going? He said, oh, it's better now. First six months weren't too good, but it's better now. And I said, oh, how's that then? He said, we conceded. Basically, they gave ground, whatever it was, to the supermarket, and then that was all right, because they got their shelf space back. Um, anyone know what the retailer margin is? You used to think 30 to 35 was pretty tough, now they want 40. So now you can't get, have your distributor anymore because you can't give them 40% and pay a distributor. So in the um, domestic market, it's very, very tough. But of course we feel very sorry for supermarkets, don't we, because of the competition from Aldi and everything else. It's really hard and poor old Woolworths, their share price is down. Okay, what does all this mean for grapes? What it means is the wine drives the grape. You can't go, here are some lovely grapes, let's see what product we can make out of them. It means we've got this product, we've got this market, we need this to make this wine, we can pay this much for the grapes, but we need this kind of grape. So it's, it's absolutely crucial to them, to the wineries, to have the grapes that they need at the right price to make this particular product. But it's difficult for growers because it means uncertainty, it means they have to be very flexible, and it also means they have to have absolutely spot on delivery of what they said they were going to deliver. Demand for grapes, who knows? Depends on the customer. We do think that um, perhaps overall what they're saying is there's not much change in the mix. Um, Jim Malara Dellis put it well to me the other day that. Uh, People say they're interested in the new varieties, but when it comes to it, they buy the old varieties. Um, some wineries did say they were going to be cutting their intake of commercial fruit. That came across quite strongly in a few places. The supply of white is tightening. Um, we didn't get to Pinot Gris today, but Pinot Gris is strong. Pinot Gris prices are up, and if you look at those previous slides, profitability on Pinot Gris is very good. However, we don't want to see that go the way of Gordo, where the price has dropped 20% this year, and two years ago it was all the flavour. Where's Nikki? Barossa Shiraz, yes, awesome. In fact, someone said Barossa Shiraz shows you what you can do when you've got a good product with a presence in the market, 
and a tight supply. But there may come a point where the price of Barossa Shiraz goes too high and again we, we lose out in the international competitive marketplace. Some people did see challenges for McLaren Vale, Langhorne Creek, Coonawa and Clare, so the less premium of the premium regions, but I'm not saying everyone said this. Um, and a couple of people were saying good things about Rattenbully and Padthaway as regions to, to do that, to make the numbers work. So the messages for growers, again, one size doesn't fit all. Um, and something else I could say to you, except I wouldn't break the confidentiality, but of the 14 people I spoke to, I don't think I could say two of them were the same. You know, some are family owned, some are corporate, some are big, some are small, some focus on the export market, some are domestic, even within exports, some of it's UK, some of it's China. They're all different. So if you can find the right winery, the right customer for your fruit, that's probably the way to go. Play to your strengths. And if all else fails, maybe find another crop. Um, some people felt that selling water was going to be profitable this season. And, or, or even just stop feeding the beast. And, and two people independently used that phrase, this very cheap fruit that goes into speculative, very cheap wine is not doing our industry any good. Um, and just finally, this was something that came up for the first time this year. It was mentioned spontaneously by a few people. Concerns about our industry, our, you know, looking in our own backyard. Um, it's a farce. This related to industry structure, too many organisations. Um, I'm disillusioned by the level of self-interest in the industry at the moment. This related to the public tax debate that's going on and there's got to be a better way. And I got a strong sense that wineries are very much in the mood for some organisational change, and some of you may know that there's going to be discussion about that sort of thing, so I think it's coming. And so this is a rotten slide to leave you with, but New Zealand do it well when it comes to industry structure, when it comes to markets. So maybe we can think about that. Thank you very much.